I, I was a student on my um, uncle's hop farm in Herefordshire for a couple of years, and he had hops, so that's where I sort of got, got used to them. And then um, I went to agricultural college and then came back here and was able to buy this farm in 1961. So that's where it all started. And what, what was here? What was at the farm when you bought it? It was mainly, um, had, a, had an acreage of hops, of 30 acres of hops. It was mainly a plum farm, uh, growing um, plums for canning mainly, which was um, a trade that grew up during the war, I think. And the, the fruit went to canners in Hereford, British canners. People was asked who ate them, you know, and I think the answer was prisons and public schools, but I don't know. <laughs> Keep them all That's regular. the other thing we can't do, we can't laugh. When you've met, <laughs> <I'm not laughs> we, can't, we can't laugh on camera. <laughs> uh, why, Can what? you just tell me why you dive, why you extended the hop side of things? Then, if you had thirty acres, the um, plum acreage had to go because the market disappeared, and uh, the hop trade was uh, reasonably profitable, so that was expanded. And then we went into. Um, uh, dessert plums, thinking that the supermarkets would have them, but they weren't very good at that. And so we now have um, dessert apples and cider fruit. So how much acreage have you got of hops and how much have you got? We, I've got a hundred acres of hops and the rest of the farm is split between cider and uh, dessert apples. So it's 200 acres altogether. Um, so can you describe to me a little bit like what what was um, what the changes have been to just in your so it's not been that long I suppose is it the sixties now what 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 would you say are the fundamental differences now from when you started? One of the fundamental differences is the uh, the influence of supermarkets, um, which came on the scene not that long ago really, um, and they. Uh, take a huge quantity of produce. Uh, we couldn't survive, we couldn't survive without um, the supermarket. Uh, before they came, came on the scene, we used to send the fruit to Birmingham on the train from Suckley Station. And uh, it was very small quantities. We never knew what we were going to get paid. And, and we didn't know whether they were going to sell it even, you know. So that's a big change. And people run down the supermarkets, but without them, we, could, we couldn't be in business, you know. And what about, um, sort of, in terms of mechanisation and workforces and things? How, you said, be, tell us a little bit about where you said just before you came here there might have been 500 people coming to pick. Can you tell us a bit about that, the, just the changes in the workforce? Yeah, when the, when the farm was uh, double the size, there was a lot more hops and uh, up till the end of the 50s I think they had about 500 hop, hop pickers on the place. All had to be housed and in what they call barracks. And they slept on straw and uh, they had to be um, looked after you know. During the war, the rations had to be rationed. I expect there were a lot of fights about that. Because <laughs> um, a lot of people that we've spoken to who who were coming and doing the hop picking, you know, we spoke to somebody from the Black Country and various other people, and people have got a very, very, very fond memories of hop picking and feel very kind of attached to those memories. Why, why do you think that people would feel so strongly about it? Why would they want to come and lay on a bed of straw and, and work, why would that form sort of strong memories for them, do you think? I think the great bond, they developed a great bond uh, in, in the hop fields and um, it was fresh air which perhaps they hadn't been used to <laughs> and, uh, um, and they earned money. I still have people coming here who 
say they came pick, 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 picked hops living in, in the Birmingham area. They still me remember it, you know. They might have been children, I don't know. Yeah, a lot, so a lot. So tell us, uh, did you ever have sort of families coming here with their children? And was yeah, the whole families used to come. They used to come on by train uh, to Suckley Station. Um, so I was told. But uh, we, di we didn't have very many. Um. So when you, tell me about then, so in your, in your early days when you were um, first setting up and first doing this, what would have been your, tell me about the, who was coming to do the picking and where they were coming from and what kind of numbers of people you might have had um, through? When I took over the farm we had 10 permanent local employees. We've only got, we've got three now, and um, and then we relied on what we call travellers for doing the picking. They used to bring their caravans, and they used to stay for the pick picking season. And what was that? Were there any kind of was there any kind of issues with that, or was it all? pretty good was it you know having children around oh no you didn't have did the travelers bring their children it was the whole family yeah prepared, yeah, yeah. Was, and was everyone working um, I think they, they worked pretty hard but it got up to a lot of tricks so they used to put the fruit was paid for by weight and then we they had bushel boxes which they filled filled with plums and if they could put bricks and stones in the bottom, they would, you know, that, that sort of thing, you know. And they'd, they had to pick the fruit with no leaves. And so if you look below, below the surface of the box, you'd find a lot of leaves, all those sort of things, you know. And then they'd go on strike sometimes for more money, which um, that was an annual event, I think. <laughs> so what, how did you solve that then, the strike? I used to be told to disappear for the rest of the day and um, they used to s sit down and do nothing for most of the day waiting for the, m the money to increase but it never did. You know, so, um, they, earned, they earned good money. If the crop was good they earned good money. And, um, it, uh, that, that disappeared eventually you know, when we started producing for the supermarkets. So what when did the when did the um, the workforce start to change then? What kind of precipitated that and what how is that where did um, I suppose you could say health and safety was a was um, one uh, one thing. The supermarkets were very, very fussy, you know. Quite rightly so. And um, they wanted a more responsible attitude towards picking and, and the fruit quality had to be improved so it demanded a different type of person really and so, so we have um, people from abroad now who come just for the summer um, they're called immigrants I don't know why they're called immigrants so they're not immigrants they're visitors <laughs> migrant workers migrants yeah. Yes, they're yeah. neither migrants or immigrants. But, um, they're very responsible people and work hard. So is there a kind of a different atmosphere on the farm? Yes, oh yes. What's, yeah. what's it like now then? Well, I think it's a lot, lot, um, lot easier, a lot healthier really. Um, they have a work, Polish people have a work ethic which I'm afraid we don't recognise in this country really anymore. You know. Extraordinary how hard they work. And what what's the draw? I mean, I know you could say the draw is the money, but is that the only draw? Do you think for people coming over? Why do why would they come all the way over here to do the work? Is it purely financial, or do you think there's largely financial? Yes, because um, when they take their money home, it's worth a lot more at home than it is here. That's changed slightly now because the pounds dropped um, what, 13%. So they get 13% less value, I suppose. Mm. But um, 
They still, still come, I think. And what, what do you, you, do you see your sort of, your, cause your son Richard farming here now with his, and, and Ali at work, do you kind of look at them and think they've got it harder or easier than you? What do you think? <laughs> or just different? <laughs> Hmm. I don't think it's any easier. It's different. Uh, they're much more into the public relations side of it all, and uh, which is important because farming has to have a good face, you know. Uh, the pub public put a lot of money into farming. They deserve a, a result, really. What's your kind of, have you got kind of um, like an abiding sort of memory, you know, what sort of, when, have you got like a particular year or a season, you just thought, oh, that was a really good, you know, you just felt this is, this is really good or there's kind of a really strong memory or a particularly kind of good workforce or a, some funny character, or, you know, what, what would kind of stick in your head really if somebody kind of said what was the got a kind of a memory that you've got what, your, you what got sticks in my head is not not the good years <laughs> there was the, the bad years there were more bad years than good ones you know so um the bad bad years are really a shock sometimes and um we had uh we had a hailstorm three years ago it lasted all of two minutes and um, completely ruined all our fruit Every single apple, you know, that sort of thing you don't forget. Luckily, we had insurance, but it's all the effort that goes into it is, um, well, it's heartbreaking for the people involved, you know. Can you tell me a bit about the um, the wilt? Can you tell me that what happened there and tell me when that was? Hmm. Yeah, that was about thirty years ago, I think. Can't remember exactly. But a uh, terrible disease that affects hop, hops called hop verticillium wilt, which kills them stone dead. And c there's no way of stopping it. And it um, affected all the hop farms in the country eventually. But um, I remember the f first plants that, uh, that I saw with it, you know, and I thought, well, the only question time for, they all have it. And we lost um, all the hops plants on the farm, and they all had to be replanted. I think the 90,000 plants we had to put replant. Uh, huge cost. But luckily, um, the plant breeders had produced hops which were resist resilient to this disease. That, that's what we grow now. You know. But um, had that not been available, we would have. And hop growing would have disappeared, you know. Uh, it was a worrying time for everybody. So what do what would um what do the what, what do although it's mechanized now, how what what do the workforce kind of what's their main job now then? The um thing that the crop that she's most uh obviously mechanized is the cider crop. Um, as I was a student, I used to go out and uh, have to pick up cider apples off the ground and put them in a bucket and then into a sack, and then they went off to Bournemouth. And now it's all me mechanised. The trees are shaken by machine, and the fruit is picked up off the ground by machine, and uh, it's bulk loaded into lorries and sent to Bournemouth. Um, so that is completely mechanised, you know, we don't never touch an apple really. We have to wash them, but um, that, that's, that's how it's done now. What about, so what's the process for hops then now? Well, hop, hops uh, is uh, fairly simple. The, the hop plant is cut off at about four foot and loaded onto uh, trailers by machine and taken to the hop picking machine in a, sta in, a, in a building and the leaves and the, and the hops are stripped off the plant and the machine separates the leaves and the hops f from, the, um, from each other and they're dried for 10 hours. 
down to 11% of moisture content and then packed into bales. Um, but it has to be done fairly accurately. We're paid on quality and uh, if they're too damp they go rotten. Um, so it's a quite a precise business really. Um, the permanent staff when I came here was number 10, 10 or 10 I suppose. Um, and they most lived, lived in farm cottages. And you'd be surprised to hear that none of them had indoor toilets, none of them had bathrooms, and um, nobody complained, it was just normal, you know. Nobody had cars. Uh, and now it's quite different, you know, the houses are modernised, and um, we only have three permanent staff on the farm. And in the picking season, we go up to 40, I think, roughly 40, um, on the hops and the, on the fruit picking. So it is, it is changed. Does it happen at the same time, the hops and the fruit picking? More or less, yes. Yeah. yes. So yeah. you have to have different people doing the different picking? Oh, it, yes. Uh, yeah. We tend to have the same people on the, on the hops as we have every year. Mm. Um, I always feel sorry for the people getting on a train and commuting, you know. <laughs> so we're lucky. We mustn't complain. So what about um, bringing a family up here? Is it, have you, is, um, was Richard always involved as a young boy? or? Yeah, he was always interested in the farm, yes. And <coughs> like all young people, they like to see the money before the work, you know, but that's all changed now. <laughs> and I have another son who, who flies um, large aeroplanes around the world, you know. So I'm very lucky, really, they're both doing what they want to do. He had a, he had a mixed farm and it was, it was very interesting, really. Uh, yeah, I, I loved every minute of it, really driving tractors and haymaking and all the things that young people like to do, you know. <laughs> so was, um, we did you get involved with the kind of, was that, would there have been hand hot picking then or not? Really? He actually had a new machine put in when I went there, you know. Uh, before that he had um, uh, people from the black country. They used to sleep and live in the pigsties. The pigs were moved out, the straw was changed and the people moved in. It's thought to be quite normal, isn't it? <laughs> so um, what, what, was you, what would your job have been then when you were 16, 17? It was more kind of driving tractors. And driving like tractors, yes, bits. yes. I hated the handwork, you know, but um, there wasn't much of that. So that's what, what got you into farming, really, was it? Yes, yes, yes. So where were you living and brought up before that, then? I was living in Suffolk. Was my, my home was there, yeah. Um, a pretty, pretty county. Very pretty. Lovely place. My father uh, worked in the city as a stock, stock, uh, stock exchange, in the stock exchange. And they lived in London, and at the beginning of the war, we had to be evacuated because of the um, threat of bombs. And uh, at very short notice, we had to leave London, and luckily, my un aunt and uncle took us in down here. And my father went off in the Navy to the war, and so we moved, moved around the country. Uh, staying with friends mainly, and eventually settled in Suffolk, where they bought a house, which was very convenient because his job was in London, you know. Uh, access to London was easy. 
at um, the countryside uh, around my home was marvellous, you know. And we had everything, rivers and fields and shooting. So I was very fortunate, really. So then when, when did you kind of move, at what made you kind of come over here then when you... Well, I had to learn a bit about farming before I went to Agricultural College. And uh, so again, I was taken in by my aunt and uncle, uh, which was very kind of them. And um, I was very fortunate to be able to come here. It was um, incident. It's interesting that it was a when it was sold at auction. It was a record price for land. It was two hundred and forty pounds an acre, which was completely unheard of then. You know, when the average price was about one hundred fifty pounds an acre, this farm, because it had a good reputation, um, fetched two hundred and forty pounds an acre. But, uh, everybody shook their heads and said he'd never make a go of it, you know. <laughs> but um, I was lucky. Still here. A friendly bank manager. So <laughs> why didn't you follow your father into the stock market then? Oh, I hated towns. Couldn't be bad towns. They always gave me a headache. They were very dirty and smoky and just, you know. <laughs> you kind of do you sit what do you, do you think it's important that we're sort of collecting these stories and memories and getting these photographs seen why, why i think it's very important otherwise it gets lost isn't it and um people are very interested in in the past and uh, there's a huge interest in in genealogy now because people want to know about their families and so, you know, it does it strikes a note with people, I think, especially if you've got photographs. Because things have changed enormously, you know. A lot of it can't be believed, really, without photographs and people, people telling, telling the story. <laughs>